and welcome to this ICME Global Awards webinar. My name is Matt Stalker and I'm your host for this morning's session. The ICME Global Awards celebrate chemical process and biochemical engineering excellence and are widely recognised as the world's most prestigious chemical engineering awards. Today we'll be announcing the winner of the ICME Young Researcher Award sponsored by BPE. This award recognises the chemical engineer under 30 years old who best demonstrates their achievements and tangible application of chemical engineering research to address important technical, economic, environmental or social issues. But before we check out our finalists, it's time to hear from our sponsor. Please welcome BPE Engineering Manager, Andrew Stevenson. Hello, everybody. I hope you can hear me OK. And thanks for the introduction. Um, my name is Andrew Stevenson. I'm the engineering manager at BPE. And today I thought I would just start with a very quick overview of who BPE is and what BPE do and why we are proud to sponsor this award. And don't worry, I, I really intend to keep it to just a couple of minutes. Uh, BPE itself is part of online group who provide integrated engineering solutions across the UK. BPE is a UK leader in chemical and biochemical engineering design and we are a process-led organization and so a high proportion of our staff are process engineers, chartered or fellows of the ICME. And we offer a full suite of process engineering services for businesses of all sizes and types. And now in addition to process design, we also provide controls and systems engineering and mechanical and process piping design. And we do this across a range of market sectors from pharmaceutical and chemical through to emerging technologies, uh, working with universities, startups, etc. And that really is one of the advantages of being a process engineer is that you get to apply those fundamentals to new and exciting challenges. Now this slide uh, just shows some of the various stages of a project or a new product life cycle and what we offer throughout these stages really from a, an output perspective. And I, at this point I should say that my background before I joined BPE was with a technology development and licensing company and so I believe I can relate in some part to the researchers in this webinar and the many frustrations and failures that often come before success. And through the consultancy side to our business, one of the services that BPE often provides is that process design assistance during the early stages of a project or new product. Uh, particularly with respect to the concept and scale up, say, from the lab benchtop scale. And we've seen that with design engineers working with development engineers, it really is a great way to provide and reach those effective industrial solutions. And BPE is proud to sponsor this Young Researcher Award. And this is because we believe that the solutions to many of the world's engineering problems will be solved by the young researchers of today and we all have a role in highlighting the value that this brings and recognizing those who are doing exceptional things and be that through improving the efficiency with which we consume the world's resources to renewable energy battery technology and the list goes on so it really is a you know an exciting time i think we could all agree to be a chemical engineer and um, and so with that, I, I don't want to keep anyone any longer and I'm, I'm excited to hear the presentations that we have coming. So unless there's any questions, I will pass back to uh, Matt. Okay, thank you, Andrew. And of course, thank you to BPE for sponsoring the award. So then here are our finalists. We start with Amani Othman Alkamati from Saudi Aramco. Anurag Pareha from CSL, Chu Kit Wayne from Zemin University, 
Chao Chong Yang from the Singapore Membrane Technology Center, Nanyang Environment and Water Research Institute and Nanyang Technological University. Lo Ling Yi from Zhejiang University. Pravaraj Balakrishnan from Jingzhou University. Samir Dayab from GSK. And finally, Vasilis Charitopoulos from University College London. All of our finalists have been invited to join us today to tell us more about their work and to answer your questions. You can type in your questions into the questions box on the GoToWebinar portal. So let's get started with our first finalist. Please welcome Vasilis Charitopoulos from UCL. Okay, hi. Um... Can everybody see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Cool. Uh, okay, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Vasilis Karitopoulos. I am uh, a lecturer from the Department of Chemical Engineering at UCL. And uh, I would like to thank you for having me as a finalist in this year's awards. So I'll start my presentation with uh, a little bit of my background. So as probably my name already has betrayed, I come from Greece. I graduated from the National Technical University of Athens with a diploma in chemical engineering. And during my undergraduate degree, I delved into the research because I was interested in aspect of uh, model predictive control and energy systems engineering. In 2015, I received a scholarship from the UCL uh, Department of Chemical Engineering to join the department to pursue my doctoral studies, where I conducted research related to digital manufacturing and optimization under uncertainty. And uh, during my studies, because of my performance and the research outputs and contributions to sustainability and process development, uh, I was awarded uh, the UCL Rookie Prize and the UCL Rookie Award. In uh, 2017, in parallel with my PhD, I also uh, started an industrial project with Linde on the game theoretic optimization of oligopolies. And uh, in 2018, I graduated uh, from the doctoral degree and I joined the University of Cambridge as a research associate, where I started working on the interface of process systems engineering and energy policy, and specifically on the decarbonization pathways for the UK power and heat sector. Uh, in 2019, I joined the Department of Chemical Engineering at UCL again, uh, this time as a lecturer, and uh, I was also awarded the Springer Thesis Award for Best uh, Doctoral Thesis, as well as the European Federation of Chemical Engineering Outstanding PhD Thesis in Cape, uh, where I was a runner-up. So this is a little bit about my background and how I've gotten here. Um, and now I'm going to talk about my research. So my research span across two distinct domains. The first one is uh, the integration of digital process systems engineering. And the motivation behind that is the main contribution that the chemical industry has uh, in the nation's healthy economy, which accounts for around uh, 50 billion of annual turnover. And at the same time, there's a lot of conversation about how do we make our uh, process industries smarter and uh, how we take advantage of the fruits of digitalization. This is further underpinned, of course, by the UK's Industrial Strategy uh, Challenge Fund. So when we think about the process industries, uh, this is a graphic that gives us an understanding about how the different functionalities work with each other. Uh, we start with the supply chain, where we take strategic decisions in the range of years, then we move down to planning, scheduling, and in order to secure uh, an enhanced uh, optimality in terms of economic performance as well as safety, we perform real-time optimization. And uh, the problem that we have here so far is that uh, if this is the expectation, most of the times expectation is not the same as reality. And uh, as you saw from this graph, uh, this is a very well interconnected structure, but the way that this is performed so far in the process industries is in a complex top-down hierarchical kind of manner. So to motivate a little bit about why my research is important, I'll give you an example about the traditional uh, hierarchical approach that is being pursued so far. So let's think about that we have this instance where a planner gets a demand of uh, some units of product A and some products of unit B, and they want that by the end of the week. Then they pass that decision down to the scheduler, and the scheduler looking at uh, their optimization or their spreadsheet say, yes, that's no problem, we've done that before. Before, we can do it now. Uh, and then the scheduler passes down the problem to the control engineer and asks, basically, depending on the process, can we shift the column between those two production regimes? And because this has been done before as well, uh, he performs some preliminary checks and says, yes, this is doable. 
Uh, fast forward uh, at the end of the week, the planner checks at uh, their log and they have successfully achieved production of product A. However, they notice that they're short of 100 units of product B. Um, and the reason behind that was because at some point throughout the week, uh, the column needed an extra day for stabilization between the different regimes. And this was not communicated in, in an integrated manner uh, to the planner. And this led to loss of production and loss of uh, customer satisfaction. And this is the problem that happens in the pros industry so far. Uh, we have these functionalities. We have uh, the top down, let's say, uh, coordination of decision making. However, we're lacking in terms of uh, integration. How do we perform on the fly in real time responsive operations? Um, so the digital integrated approach that I'm investigating basically uh, aims to exploit uh, advances from the fields of machine learning and data-driven optimization together with uh, formal computational frameworks so as to perform these computations in an integrated manner in real time so as to secure better asset utilization, decreased costs and increased responsiveness. An example of this uh, where I have published a monograph with Springer and a number of articles uh, relates to the integration of planning, scheduling and control, where you can see here that we have uh, the integration and the top-down and the level-up uh, passing of the decisions. And this is a multi-scale problem. These problems are challenging, but at the same time, uh, through our work and application to different processes, we have indicated that whenever you integrate those functionalities together and you take the decisions in a coordinated manner, there is a hidden flexibility that you unblock and you can effectively exploit in order to improve your, both your resource utilization and your um, responsiveness to the market. And what is nice about these frameworks is the fact that they're applicable for different reasons to a wide variety of processes, such as energy, energy intensive processes from the air separation sector, where they can use this framework uh, to perform efficient demand, industrial demand side response and respond to uh, electricity price fluctuations, or from the continuous farm and the oil and gas sector, where they are confronted uh, with an increasing, uh, increasingly volatile market environment. The second thing relates to the decarbonization and the main uh, aspect here that I'm uh, conducting research is on the interface of energy systems engineering, policy and business. Um, and the motivation behind that is the legal obligation that the UK has for achieving net zero by mid-century. There's a lot of discussion about system flexibility, the role of different energy carriers, are we going to move towards a hydrogen-led economy? Uh, and the key point across all this is the fact that we are moving from a firm generation landscape to a more volatile one, where not only the generation is volatile, but the consumer, us, uh, we're becoming an active participant into the energy market. So with that respect, I've been conducting research on the decarbonization of the UK heat sector. This is work that is done in collaboration with the University of Cambridge, the UK CCSRC and the four uh, gas network operators across the UK. And uh, the problem that we're dealing here is that we need to consider in a whole systems uh, manner where process systems, systems engineering and chemical engineers play a fundamental role. By considering the different alternatives that we have about heat electrification, are we moving towards a hydrogen-led economy or a hybrid system with biomass and heat networks? What are the trade-offs? Uh, because as we can see for, from these graphs, when we compare heat, the heat sector to the electricity sector, the heat sector is very specific in terms of location. So the different regions in the UK uh, exhibit different behavior, but at the same time, it's very volatile. So sizing your system and, and performing capital expenditure to cover for such a system is highly problematic. And everybody has come to the conclusion that there is no silver bullet. So what we've done is that we collaborate with National Grid, Ofgem, and the gas network operators to investigate the trade-offs and identify optimal regional strategies so as to minimize capital expenditure and mitigate the impacts of fuel poverty uh, across the UK. Uh, I'm going to finalize my presentation uh, with some indicators of research impact. So uh, in terms of policy, I'm a member of the Business Energy and Industrial Strategy CCUS Early Career Forum, where I interact with the policymakers, the government and other researchers informing the agenda around the decarbonization and uh, the, land, the landscape in CCUS. Uh, and within the first year of my lectureship, I have attracted uh, over 2 million in grants from UKRI and EPSRC. And another aspect over here is that we conduct research on the medical oxygen supply chain optimization for combating uh, COVID in the UK. 
And this pertains to the first thing where we basically employ whole system approaches and integration approaches just to make sure that we never fall short of uh, oxygen supply chain for the demand that we face due to COVID. And the second project relates to the risk management for uh, national infrastructure uh, about hydrogen and achieving net zero. Uh, I'm also a member of the inter-engineering community. Uh, I identify as a, a gay engineer and it's a big importance for me to uh, spread the work and uh, spread the word and increase visibility within the chemical engineering community. And in terms of uh, stakeholders engagement, uh, my research is um, uh, done in collaboration with a number of uh, stakeholders. We deal with the Committee of Climate Change, University of Cambridge, NETL in the US, National Grid, Johnson Murphy, and Linda. And with that, I think I'll finish my presentation. I will thank you for your time and uh, I'll happily take any questions. And if you want to contact me, you can either find me on Twitter or uh, send me an email. Okay. okay, thank you very much. So we will pause for questions. And if you have a question, please type it into the questions box on the GoToWebinar portal. Well, we'll give you a moment on that. Uh, we're live tweeting throughout the ICME Global Awards webinars. So if you are a Twitter user, you can also get involved using the hashtag ICME Awards. OK, we don't appear to have any questions. So thank you, Vasilis. We're going to move yeah. on. It's now time to welcome our next finalist. Please welcome Amani Othman al Kamadi from Saudi Aramco. Hello, good day, everyone. Uh, thank you for attending my presentation. Um, I don't know if you can see my slides. Yes, we can. Yes, thank you. All right. So my name is Amani Ramdi. I am a research scientist working for uh, Expec Advanced Research Center in Saudi Aramco. And it is my sincere pleasure to be with you here today to talk about my research in two different opposing industries, I would say. Uh, so let's start. Uh, well, my journey in the energy industry in general started with uh, hydrogen uh, or catalysis design for hydrogen fuel cells. Uh, the story is hydrogen can be an excellent source for clean as well as uh, sustainable energy only if the technology is able to overcome barriers when it comes to the storage of hydrogen. So conventionally, hydrogen is stored uh, either as a compressed or cryocompressed uh, gas or as a liquefied hydrogen. However, uh, none of these solutions are ideal either from an engineering, safety or even um, economic perspective. So our idea here was to store hydrogen in uh, certain materials. And in our case, we believe that liquid organic hydrates can be an excellent candidate to store hydrogen in the form of chemical bonds. So with the help of sufficient catalysts, uh, one can hydrogenate and dehydrogenate those liquid organic hydrates to uh, generate hydrogen that can ultimately be fed into a hydrogen fuel cell that will generate electricity and heat. And the only byproduct that we will have uh, will be water. So it's like 100% clean technology. However, as we said, uh, a sufficient system requires a catalyst with high selectivity towards the endothermic reaction that is uh, shown in this equation over here. And uh, for this, uh, platinum-based catalysts, which are known to be very quite expensive, are the best actually to promote this forward reaction uh, that would lead to the generation of hydrogen. And also it's the most uh, selective catalyst to prevent the side reaction that would lead to the cracking of the carbon-carbon bond. But as we said, platinum is very expensive. So we were exploring different elements in the periodic table and nickel in this case shows, uh, experimentally shows a promising activity. So uh, we decided to take this further and our contribution to this was dedicated to understanding those catalysis processes at the atomic scale. So uh, what we were doing is that we uh, try to understand the energies of absorption of those molecules upon the cracking of the carbon-hydrogen bond or upon the dehydrogenation cycle. 
and we are trying ultimately to compare between nickel and platinum in the efficiency of the dehydrogenation and what we can see is a lot of interesting insights and a lot of uh, uh, chemical insights actually uh, that will show that nickel can actually be a promising catalyst to replace platinum for commercial applications uh, not only that we were interested in comparing nickel with platinum, but also we were trying to understand the uh, specific chemistry that takes place at those very flat, smooth surfaces of uh, platinum and nickel or any metal in general. And we were focusing on understanding uh, the... the um, uh, let me show a pointer in here if I can. Yes, we were trying to understand the effect of those alkyl substituents to the energies of absorption. And what we find in here is actually very peculiar and interesting because it actually ex uh, explains what we see in the uh, practical application on in the industry. Uh, because this species actually, when, when you remove a carbon hydrogen bond from the methyl group, this species becomes more stable on the surface. Uh, because this carbon hydrogen bond cracking is exothermic, unlike a cracking from the aromatic ring, which is quite endothermic. And this will explain the uh, uh, essential role of hydrogen co-feeding to produce the parent molecule, uh, which is in this case toluene, in the practical application. And actually, uh, this concept can be applied to all types of alkyl aromatics, even if you have a molecule with two uh, two methyl groups like xylene or even three methyl groups like mesethylene and also if you have long branched and kinds like uh, in the case of ethyl benzene so this was uh, very interesting and uh, now i'm going to move on to the uh, far end of the spectrum to talk about non-renewable energy so after uh, finishing my graduate studies working on hydrogen storage uh, I have joined the upstream industry to work on uh, oil and uh, in our group we are interested in enhanced oil recovery research and uh, what we do in here is uh, or our challenge in here is that um, as we know uh, uh, as we know uh, hydrocarbons are uh, are uh, stored in reservoirs subsurface reservoir inside the poor matrix of those very highly heterogeneous rocks and uh, it is recovered through uh, multiple processes and starting with primary production in which engineers will uh, will uh, use the internal pressure of the reservoir to actually push the oil out and when the uh, internal pressure uh, starts to slightly go down, uh, they would go to other methods in which they will inject water or gas to push uh, the oil out and uh, maintain the pressure of the oil. However, when you move into uh, tertiary modes of recovery, uh, in which you will need to inject chemicals or, or even uh, certain water chemistry or even alkalines, you will actually need to understand the chemistry and the physics that takes place within the poor matrix of those uh, rocks and oil and uh, water systems. It's a very complex system. And what we do in our group called smart water flooding is that we manipulate the chemistry of the injected water to be able to achieve a certain uh, wetting condition that is favorable for uh, the sweeping of the oil and uh, uh, the enhanced oil recovery. Uh, we do a lot of uh, lab work, we do a lot of uh, micro scale studies, uh, even atomic scale studies, and uh, we actually have the privilege to implement our technologies in the field. And uh, my contr uh, or our contribution to this was uh, quite minimal compared to the large publication uh, on this area. It's a very active area of research because it's, it's, it's very promising. And what we do is that we um, uh, measure the electrokinetic interactions that take place at two interfaces. In this case, we have oil water interface and rock water interface. And what we do is that we measure the zeta potential at those two interfaces and they're related to the contact angle that we that we see for, for in the lab in the measurement. And what we see is that we when we inject high salinity water. Uh, we will have a different polarity of charges at the two interfaces. 
this different polarity of charge, we believe that it will lead to the uh, uh, destabilization of this water film that separates the oil from the rock and would lead actually to the collapse of this film and the adherence of the oil to the rock. However, if you move into uh, smart water, which is in this case uh, 10 times reduced salinity with certain concentrations of sulfate ion and uh, a certain ratio of divalent cations to monovalent cations, what we see is that we uh, actually can uh, flip the potentials and uh, get to see a similar polarity of charge at the two interfaces which uh, we believe is uh, going to lead to uh, a stabilized water film that would lead to actually a bigger contact angle, a water width system, and uh, of course, uh, enhanced oil recovery. Uh, our work in this area was very well received in the uh, Society of Petroleum Engineers and also in the uh, colloidal science and community uh, in which we have multiple uh, publications in this area. Uh, now that I've came to the end of my presentation, just wanted to say that I've shown you an example of someone who worked on both uh, different energy, uh, energy industries that uh, some of them, despite being uh, much cleaner, cleaner or much more economic or much more efficient, uh, but both of them share the same challenge, which is to provide the world with the energy that it requires to function. And uh, for me, as a young professional, I would say it's been a wonderful journey. And uh, there's been a lot of uh, uh, interesting insights from both and uh, lots of knowledge transfer between the two industries. Uh, that's been uh, really added value to my career. And uh, thank you all very much for your kind listening. And if you would like to reach me, this is my email. Thank you. Back to you. Okay, thank you very much. So once again, we'll pause for Q&A. If you have a question, please type it into the questions box. We have our first question. Uh, do you have any information about the lifetime of the catalyst to develop hydrogen? Um, the lifetime of the catalyst. Will you mean, uh, are you referring to uh, what they call a uh, cock formation that will um, perhaps um, uh, ruin the catalyst, I suppose. Uh, but uh, actually, I am myself, uh, my work in this area has been purely computational. Uh, there are some people who worked on the experiment in this one, and they might be able to have a, let's say, tangible feeling of uh, a lifetime of a catalyst or, or so. But for me, as a computational chemist in this area, I was mainly interested in understanding the energetics uh, of chemisorption and desorption from the surface and also the structure of those molecules uh, upon interacting with the catalyst. But I, I would, I would uh, if you're interested, uh, reach me and I would refer you to the right person to answer your question. Okay, thank you. Our uh, next question, what is your take on CO2, EOR and CCS? CO2, EOR. Uh, we have actually a focus area in our group that works on uh, CO2, EOR, and actually it's, um, I think it's uh, very promising because it, it's, it, it achieves the both goals of uh, capturing carbon from the air and uh, storing it underground and also capture the value of enhancing the oil recovery. So I would say it's like a win-win situation in which you can uh, actually uh, recycle this carbon by injecting it and uh, also by achieving the recovery of oil without without going into chemicals or alkalines or uh, uh, situations in which you will that will lead to more emissions, I would say. Okay, thank you very much. It's time to move on, so thank you for your presentation. It's now time for our third finalist, and please welcome from CSL, Anurag Paraha. Hello, everyone. Can you guys see my screen? Has it come through? Yes, we can, yes. All righty. Uh... I'm gonna hide this. Here we go. All right. Uh, I hope you guys can hear me all right as well. Yes, we can. Yes. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, hi, hi everyone. I'm Anurag Parihar, and I'm a senior scientist at CSL. 
Uh, it's the largest uh, biotech company in Australia. And I am uh, grateful to iChemy for giving me the opportunity uh, to present my work on conversion of uh, lignocellulosic waste to high value bio-based chemicals. So in today's talk, I'll uh, give you guys a brief overview of uh, lignocellulosic waste and I'll explain why it's crucial to convert lignocellulosic waste to bio-based chemicals. I'll also provide an overview of a novel thermocatalytic process we have developed for producing uh, bio-based chemicals from lignocellulosic waste and very briefly touch upon our current endeavors for uh, process scale-up and commercialization. All right, so lignocellulosic waste or lignocellulosic biomass is essentially a complex network of homo and heteropolymers like cellulose, semicellulose, and lignin. And it is the most abundant renewable raw material uh, on earth. Uh, unlike other renewable resources like solar, geothermal, wind, or hydro, uh, the singularity of lignocellulosic waste lies in the chemical energy stored in it. Uh, some of the examples of lignocellulosic waste include your backyard waste, wood chips, or even agricultural waste. Currently, majority of this lignocellulosic waste is being, is being utilized for production of energy. That is, most of the chemical energy is being utilized for energy production. However, biorefining for energy production is very susceptible to uh, fluctuating prices of fossil-based resources. Say, for example, if the price of the barrel of a crude oil significantly plummets, uh, biorefining becomes uh, economically unviable venture. So there's a strong need uh, to expand the product portfolio of a biorefinery, a biorefinery wherein we produce energy as well as a lot of other products and make it sustainable um, and economically viable to take solid steps in the direction of uh, a green and circular economy. And the inspiration for expanding the product portfolio can come from petrochemical industry itself. Uh, this is an example. If you, if you take a look at the revenue of the petrochemical industry, you would notice that half of it uh, comes from chemicals, which constitute only 16% um, of its uh, business by volume. And similar model perhaps could be adopted for, bio uh, bio for a biorefinery, wherein the chemical energy stored in biomass is not only converted for production of energy, but uh, chemicals as well. But what are some chemicals which could perhaps be uh, you know, produced from uh, lignocellulosic waste? As I just mentioned, there's a range of chemicals like C1 to C5 chemicals, which are uh, produced from uh, current fossil-based resources. But uh, the strategic advantage of a biorefinery lies in C6 chemicals, uh, which, which are not readily available from uh, shale gas or fossil-based resources, and some of which also offer very high functionality and serve as excellent uh, uh, source of platform chemicals. Now, an example of that is 5-hydroxymethylferferol. Uh, which has ex uh, excellent functionality and whose derivatives find applications uh, in a range of industry. Uh, an analog of 5-hydroxymethylferferol called 5 chloromethylferferol which is more stable and less hydrophilic, also finds applications uh, in a range of industries like fuel industry, pharma industry, even polymer industry. Uh, another uh, C6 chemical of interest is levoglucosinone. And as you could see from the schematic here, it has applications in dairy industry, polymer industry, uh, pharma industry, and so on and so forth. And, and it's not surprising to see that uh, these chemicals actually feature uh, in the list of top 10 bio-based chemicals identified by, uh, by, by government of UK as economically critical. Now, uh, we have developed a process which converts uh, this lignocellulosic waste into high-value bio-based chemicals uh, like levoglucosinone and 5 chloromethylferferol And the process has been developed in fluidized bed reactor because of its technological strengths uh, listed here. So like it offers good temperature control, efficient heat transfer, and the most important part, or I would say the most lucrative part for a process engineer is that it's, it's very simple to construct and operate the bubbling fluidized bed reactor technology. And it allows the process engineer to scale uh, the process developed in it, say from lab scale to bench scale and eventually commercial scale. And we have strong ambitions and aspirations to take a process eventually to commercial scale. Let me give you a, a very quick snapshot of uh, our system. Uh, 
This is the schematic of a thermocatalytic reactor system. Uh, and this is the lab scale realization of that system. So this is the first scale itself. As you could see, there's a fluidized bed reactor where the conversion occurs. And then on top, you have a feeder which feeds biomass or lignocellulosic waste. Then at the bottom, there is an apparatus for generating uh, acid gas, which acts as catalyst as well as co-reactant. Uh, co then we have a quencher for rapidly quenching the volatiles or the products of interest and eventually a, a, a base trap which uh, quickly uh, neutralizes the residual acid gas and minimizes the adverse effect on environment of, uh, of a releasing acid gas. Now I'll give you a quick overview of some of uh, the results we have obtained. On the left is the gas chromatograph obtained from very regular uh, thermal conversion of uh, lignocellulosic waste. And on your right is the gas chromatograph obtained when the same waste is subjected to our thermocatalytic process. As you could see, uh, the acid gas we use, uh, it increases the yield and selectivity of levoglucosanone, and it reacts with biomass and produces chemical of interest, in this case, 5 fluoromethylphenicol. And obviously, it also produces a range of uh, 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 smaller uh, other chemicals. Uh, but the salient feature of uh, this particular process is that it significantly reduces the gunk and increases the selectivity uh, towards the chemical of interest. Next up is the quantitative representation of the graph I showed you in the previous slide deck. Uh, as you could see, uh, use, uh, our thermocatalytic process increases the, again, yield and selectivity of levoglucosanone, which is a high value bio-based chemical, and it reacts with biomass and produces 5-chloromethylpetrol. Uh, um, we have also identified uh, critical process parameters which uh, govern the yield of these chemicals in uh, the final product, temperature being one of them, and feed to catalyst ratio is the other one. Uh, and we can also tweak uh, these parameters in a way that uh, the concentration of uh, these chemicals in the final product, uh, in the final product uh, is uh, uh, changed as per the uh, desires of the process engineer who is operating the process. So essentially, uh, we can raise the concentration of a particular uh, ingredient and move the distribution towards 5-chloromethylphenicol, uh, or we can uh, bring it back um, to the minimal value and move the distribution towards levoglucosanone. So we have a kind of lever wherein we can influence the uh, concentration of these chemicals in the final product. Uh, aside from those two chemicals, our ongoing mass spectrometry-based characterization studies have also revealed that uh, the, the, uh, the process produces a chloride derivative of uh, uh, levulinic acid, most likely levulinic acid, uh, which is interestingly another chemical which features in the same list of top 10 bio-based chemicals uh, identified uh, by UK as economically uh, critical. Uh, now, as I said earlier, we have very strong aspirations for scaling this up. And in fact, we have uh, built and commissioned a bench scale continuous flea, uh, feed fluidized bed reactor. This particular reactor has significantly bumped up our production capacity and the reactor can process up to five kilogram of um, lignocellulosic waste per hour and, and it can produce up to two and a half liters of product per hour. So there's a significant increase in the amount of uh, uh, raw material we can process and amount of product we can generate. And we also appreciate the fact uh, that it is uh, very uh, crucial to uh, purify the chemicals which are there in the final product to facilitate better downstream applications. And we have developed a process for purifying these chemicals. Uh, so basically isolating a levoglucosanone and 5 chloromethylphenicol and so on and so forth, and increasing its purity in a manner that it becomes suitable for downstream applications. Now, currently, we are uh, securing and strengthening our intellectual property so that we can pitch it to investors uh, and attract funds for uh, moving towards pilot scale operations, which is another step for commercialization. And I think this platform would uh, actually give us an opportunity to make a pitch stronger. Um, well, this brings me to my ultimate slide. Uh, all, all this wouldn't have been possible uh, without the support of my advisor, uh, Professor Sankar Bhattacharya, and I'm also immensely grateful to uh, my academic partners and industry partners who have been generously sponsoring our research. And I want to give a huge shout out to uh, our other team members, 
uh, Chandan Kundu, who is a doctoral student at Monash Uni, and research engineer Kibria. Uh, both of them have been tirelessly working uh, to scale this process and take steps towards commercialization. So this brings me uh, to the conclusion of my presentation. Thank you so much for your patience and I'm open to questions. Okay, thank Happy you very much. So once again, we'll pause for questions. We'll give you a moment to type those into the questions box on the GoToWebinar platform. And while we do that, it's a good time to thank our volunteer judging panel, led by head judge Keith Batchelor. The judges work tirelessly to review and score every entry across all of our categories. You can find out more about the judging panel and their work on the ICME Global Awards web pages. Okay, we don't appear to have any questions, so we're going to move on. Thank you very much. It's now Thank time to welcome you. our next finalist from Jammin University. It's Chu Kit Wayne. Can you all see the screen? Yes, we can. Okay, great, thanks. All right, so I'd like to take this opportunity to thank ICAMI uh, Global Awards, and also congratulations to all the winners across the globe. Uh, so maybe I'll just have this quick uh, quick introduction to myself. Wait, can I do this? Right, okay, so I'm currently a lecturer at the School of Energy and Chemical Engineering at Salmon University, Malaysia. I actually did my PhD in the University of Nottingham, also in Malaysia. That was in 2019. So far, I've been a researcher in several groups, right? That includes the Bioseparation Research Group, uh, the Food and Pharmaceutical Engineering Research Group, as well as just a short uh, attachment at the Nanotechnology and Catalysis Research Center in the University of Malaya. So my research actually involves around more towards the upstream and downstream processing of renewable sources, such as uh, microalgae. So what I do is I can uh, I do this bioprocessors design as well as their optimization in order to get the best efficiency to extract biomolecules from these renewable sources. And also I'm working on the sustainable bioprocessing and finding out other kinds of routes which we can get uh, bioproducts through more greener and more efficient techniques. So of course, the, my research achievement is uh, owed to not just me alone, but also with the help of my supervisor and all my collaborators. So together with their help, I have managed to publish over 70 journal articles, more than half of them in Q1 journals. I have edited several book chapters and am currently editing about two, uh, two full books. I was given the opportunity to co-supervise uh, several PhD students together with my uh, collaborators, close collaborators at the University of Nottingham. I have uh, collaborators from various countries uh, all across Southeast Asia. Hopefully I can also penetrate to the uh, US and the UK to find better uh, collaborative work. So if any of you are interested, yeah, you can always contact me. I was given the opportunity to guest edit in several uh, journals as listed here, Journal of Hazardous Material, Chemosphere, and I'm also the review editor for Two Frontiers Journal. All right, so that's about myself. Now I've come to my research section. So basically I work on the upstream and the downstream processing. That will include for the upstream is actually on how we can get more of the biomass, meaning that processes that help to generate more of the products. Okay, so once I develop like uh, fermentation or cell cultivation techniques, then I will get more of the biomass, which will then proceed to the downstream processing. Maybe I have a pointer. Okay, so once I we optimize uh, the parameters like you know, like conditions, uh, maybe concentration of the nutrients, uh, sunlight, or the kinds, uh, depending on the type of nutrient or condition that's required, then once we have more biomass, I'll proceed to the downstream. So at this part, I will develop new bioprocess design, which I can use to extract uh, much more biomolecules in a more efficient manner. Also, I'm looking into more green techniques and uh, ways that I can recycle the solvents used. Okay, so that will be included under the downstream processing. Okay, mainly, I work on the microalgae biomass, so that will include uh, species like Chlorella or Spirulina, Actually, this microalgae is uh, 
something that I'm not sure if you know, but microalgae is something, actually they just grow on water. They only need sunlight and minimal nutrients together with carbon dioxide. So sometimes if you come across stagnant water surfaces, what you will see is that there are these green, greenish colored things that grow on top of them. So of course, they not everyone will like them because they are considered like uh, algae bloom. Actually, this algae contains very useful biomolecules, which we can use, right? And this major portion inside microalgae consists of carbohydrates, proteins, and oil. And this can be used for various functions. Maybe the carbohydrate section, we can use it for chemicals or also uh, biofuel. And the proteins, they can be used to make uh, nutritional supplements uh, in replacement for the proteins that will otherwise be made from other food crops. Right, that will also solve the global hunger issue or the lack of food. Okay, and the lipid section of this microalgae, we can transform them into biofuel, which we can help to create biodiesel and then to, to overcome the depletion of fossil fuel, maybe 50 years to come. Right, and the best part about this algae is that it only requires sunlight, carbon dioxide, water, and just minimal fertilizer. So everything that it uses is functioning just like similar to a plant. Right, because sunlight is also a, re a renewable source and uh, carbon dioxide for photosynthesis and just water and minimal nutrient. So that's quite a powerful renewable source, which can actually potentially replace right, the conventional food crops that we use uh, otherwise for producing the biomolecules that we desire. So my work involves in the biorefinery of this microalgae, not just producing one product, but uh, the possibility of producing multiple products. And uh, there's a potential to uh, not only uh, just by producing the bioproducts, but also utilizing some components from the industry. So uh, for example, the carbon dioxide flue gas from industry or the waste heat and wastewater, we can actually get them from industry and use them to cultivate microalgae. So the best part about this is that uh, at the same time of producing the products that we want, this microalgae has the potential to treat wastewater. For example, if I obtain wastewater from uh, maybe palm oil mill, okay, so it will contain these valuable nutrients, which will help to feed the microalgae. At the same time, the wastewater will be treated. So we can call that like a two-in-one, so simultaneous uh, bioremediation as well as the bioproducts conversion. And the plus point is that we only need to add the uh, light, which we can get from sunlight and also carbon dioxide, flue gas from the industry. And this microalgae will produce not only the products, but also oxygen. So making it a net carbon positive process, right? So that, that's quite advantageous. But the current problem about producing bioproducts from microalgae is actually the cost. Right. So the cost factor is significant because so far, the ability to produce a lot of these biomolecules from algae requires a quite tedious process. And uh, the purification costs for these processes are also quite high. So my research involves in trying to develop a technique which we can extract these biomolecules in a more cheaper and cost-effective manner in order to commercialize yeah, this process. So with the help of my group, okay, we have developed uh, several processes known as liquid biphasic and triphasic system. These processes involve the use of two solvents and uh, these two solvents are immiscible with each other. That means that they will form two different phase. Uh, one, the, the desired oil molecules that we want will go to one phase and what happens is the other phase will then take the contaminant byproducts that we do not want. So this process will enable us to just uh, directly extract out what we desire, okay? which is the, let's say if I want maybe pigments, so the pigments will go to the top phase and the contaminant proteins will go to the bottom phase, depending on the solvent that is selected. And from there, I can directly extract the desired biomolecules. So not just for two-phase system, we have also uh, added with different pretreatment, let's say for bubbling process or this one, the ultrasonic, process in order to disrupt the cells of the microalgae so that they will release all the biomolecules. Now this system is advantageous because uh, we only we also have the potential to upscale them and also increase the recycling because the solvents used are actually recyclable and yeah as we proceed on to different cycles we can actually recycle a lot of this component and then we can just extract what we want from the top phase and then we can start to use them. 
in this uh, multi-phase bar separation system, we actually will edit and modify, alter a lot of these different parameters, which includes like maybe different kinds of solvent. Okay, we can also change the pH value, air flotation time, crude extraction concentration, the top and bottom phase, the okay, air flotation rate, maybe volume ratio, solvent ratio, the intensity of the pretreatment, and what type of pretreatment. Okay, so we can include like maybe ultrasonication, homogenization, microwave, the temperature, and once we alter to the best condition through our optimization, then we will perform the analysis on the final product. Let's say for this one, this phycocyanin. So I will check the purity, and uh, recently yeah, it's discovered that we can get quite high purity, almost 90%. Okay, for the recovery and a much better purification full compared to the conventional methods. This one here is actually a three-phase system. So it consists of proteins at the top phase. Uh, the middle phase will be the lipids okay, and the remaining biomass, and the bottom phase will contain the carbohydrate. So this system will work as maybe a biorefinery, not just producing only one component, but from each phase, I can extract a desired component. Thereby, I will not have any waste. Right? At the same time, once I have obtained the component I want, I will recycle back this portion and then reuse in the next batch. So that will constitute as a circular system in order to have no wastage and maximum recovery. Okay, and this one is for the uh, astaxanthin. So the advantage of having this biorefinery system okay, is that uh, Let's say from the microalgae biomass, instead of producing only one component, uh, as the previous uh, previous works have been done, when people just use microalgae to produce, let's say, biofuel, so that is insufficient to justify the cost, right? So hence, the biofuels that are produced from algae are actually quite expensive. But uh, what we have, what we are developing here is that uh, the technique in order to produce more than one component. So not just the lipids for biofuel, but maybe proteins for nutritional supplements, uh, carbohydrates for bioethanol. And if we can produce more than one compound from just one biomass, and after we have extracted everything from it, the remaining portion can also be used as maybe fertilizer. So that will increase the, uh, the not just the products, okay, we can increase the economical economic feasibility of what we can obtain from selling various products and also using the end product, which we have extracted everything, then we can also further utilize or sell them. Okay, and this biorefinery is just same like what we see in the petroleum refinery. So from the crude, uh, crude oil, right, then they will develop various kinds of products. So we do the same thing. We just get one biomass and then we produce as many things as we can from the same biomass uh, through different steps and different processes. But what we're developing is just one single process in order to produce all the desired biomolecules. Right, so this is just a representation, a brief one. So from the algae, we start from the sunlight. Okay, we give it sunlight, carbon dioxide, some nutrients, and then uh, through the cell destruction phase, maybe add some pretreatment techniques, okay, or some purification steps. Then from here, we can have the oil fraction, the protein fraction, the carbohydrate fraction, and even some of the minerals the antioxidant properties as well as the maybe vitamins okay, that we can gain. Because this microalgae functions are similar to plants, so they also contain various kinds of beneficial and functional food properties, which are actually quite, uh, it's quite amazing to, to see that there are about more than tens of thousands of species and each species contains their own uniqueness depending on the, which type. Okay, and all these fractions can then be divided so let's say biodiesel, okay, maybe proteins can be used as uh, value added, nutritional products, or also supplements, sometimes directly as supplements, we can also get uh, the carbohydrate fraction, maybe for fuels, and maybe for the mineral portion, we can also use them as value added products. Okay, so these are actually the list of these uh, potential applications, apart just from these. They can also be used as uh, antimicrobial, anti-inflammatory, some species will have more of these properties and the others less, but uh, depending on which kind of products we want to get, then we can source for the appropriate species and then uh, perform this purification method, which is the liquid biphasic system, since it will uh, be compatible. Okay, as long as it can form two phases, then it will extract the desired components in the phase we want, 
together with the help of the system. Right, so we also have some antioxidant properties, then some can go into biofuel, bioenergy, and then fertilizer. So let's say microalgae, we can also uh, paralyze them, make them into biochar, and then further use them for fertilizer. Uh, or we can also create high value biomolecules, anti-cancer, anti-tumor, as well as used in the chemical industry. So not just for this uh, conventional products, but also uprising products that are made of algae. Perhaps maybe in the future, we can have like algae bioplastic, right, which will help to counter the non-degradable plastic sources currently. So these are actually a few of the projects that uh, I'm working on currently. Uh, some of them is funded by the government, some is part of the industrial funding. Okay, so these projects are being conducted together with my research group and also with the help of my supervisor. So yeah, maybe if you have any interest in any of these projects, yeah, you can always uh, contact me and then we can uh, discuss further on them. So not just on microalgae, I also work slightly on the palletization of food waste because uh, in Malaysia, food waste disposal is also quite a problem. So instead of uh, use, wasting food, we can utilize them by converting them into compost and then further uh, palletizing them, not just for fertilization, but also for bioenergy production. Okay, and then uh, the problem about solving wastewater through microalgae bacteria cultivation, which has been proven to uh, create a more better symbiosis between microalgae and the bacteria in order to help to bioremediate this wastewater in a more efficient manner. At the same time, they can produce the desired products right, contained inside microalgae. So most of my research is actually uh, driven towards the sustainable development goals, particularly for number three, to create better pharmaceutical products, right, nutritional supplements at a cost-effective price. Okay, then we also have cleaner water. So the microalgae, I've studied them and their ability to treat wastewater. So we don't have to use the conventional wastewater plant. We can incorporate this microalgae and they will help to treat wastewater at the same time, they will grow larger and they will then assimilate the nutrients from wastewater and produce the biomass. Okay, affordable and clean energy, this one I hope to produce, to find a more effective way in order to produce these biofuels from microalgae so that maybe in future we can potentially replace the conventional fuel from fossil fuels and uh, replace them with biofuels. Okay, and then sustainable cities by creating these uh, cities that could be powered by algae, algae energy as uh, algae only requires sunlight as well as carbon dioxide. So I think that will be maybe a green city in the future and also to help the life below water through treating the water and giving a much more cleaner environment. So of course uh, all this is not possible with the help of uh, all my members in my research group, especially to uh, my supervisor at the University of Nottingham, Prof. Sho Paolock. And yeah, if you'd like to know more information, you can go to our research group to have, uh, to have a look. Then you can see the research we are working on and uh, perhaps we can collaborate if you're interested. Okay. Thank you so much for your attention. If you have uh, any questions, yeah, you can let me know. Okay, thank you very much. So once again, we'll pause for questions. If you do have one, please type it into the questions box now. And while we wait for questions, if you've been suitably inspired to submit your own entry to next year's ICME Global Awards, keep an eye on our website for 2021 entry information. We typically open for entries at the start of March every year. Okay, we have our first question. Uh, since the biomass composition can be different depending on how it is collected, Will the desired product yield that can be developed from the biorefinery process be changed? Yes, depending on uh, which kind of biomass composition we want, we can change the, we can optimize different parameters to see which parameter can give us uh, the most of the desired compounds that we want. Let's say if we want more lipid, then maybe the pretreatment process, we can adjust them accordingly so that uh, more lipids will be released or at least uh, they will not be damaged during the process. Okay, this thank you very much. Yeah, sorry, carry on. No, it's okay. 
thank okay. you. <laughs> well, uh, we, we need to move on. So thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. It's now time to move on to our next finalist. Please welcome Chow Chong Yang. Just need you to unmute your microphone as well. Okay. Uh, can you see my screen now? Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Chong Yang, who is currently working at Singapore Membrane Technology Center. Uh, today, my topic is about the behavior of nanoporous material uh, in post combustion uh, CO2 capture. Uh, in the previous speakers, uh, I've been talking about energy and also. Uh, common uh, some dioxide catcher process. So I'm talking about a different approach. So here I just like to give a brief introduction about my research area. So in general, I've been doing on gas separation, which are not limited to a greenhouse gas separation, such as carbon dioxide separation, which is captured from the flue gas, and also the air separation, which is the current project that we are be doing with, actually to get a higher uh, oxygen and rich air for gasification process and also for hydrocarbon separation, which is about alkene alkane separation. Uh, in this presentation, I'll be focusing more on the greenhouse gas separation. So first of all, uh, let's give a brief introduction about the uh, uh, greenhouse gas. So generally, as we all know, uh, greenhouse gas uh, has been present uh, in the Earth atmosphere for a long time to actually ensure that the environment is sufficiently warm for the survival of living organisms. Uh, nonetheless, uh, in recent years, uh, especially in the 19th century, due to the rapid industrialization, uh, the amount of greenhouse gas in the atmosphere has shown a drastic increase over the years, which the concentration has surpassed 400 ppm since 2015. So therefore, uh, people have been shown different approach uh, to, to combat this, such as in the year 1997, actually there are four gases, such as CO2, uh, methane, nitrous oxide, and sulfur hexafluoride has been uh, the four important greenhouse gas that needs to be regulated. And also for information, we also conduct uh, research on the sulfur hexafluoride uh, separation, although it's not a uh, focus in this work. So generally, my main presentation will be mainly on the greenhouse gas. So generally, just an idea how the greenhouse gas is typically generated. For example, it is typically done by the combustion process. That means through the combustion of fossil fuels and coals actually will generate the CO2, which is the uh, carbon dioxide. So typically to prevent the CO2 to be emitted uh, to the atmosphere, typically there are approaches to actually uh, capture this greenhouse gas. So this process is typically called as the carbon capture and sequestration process, where this process typically has been reported to contribute at least 70% of the total cost that's required. So generally there are a few major types of the green CO2 capture depending on the application such as post-combustion, CO2 capture, pre-combustion, oxygen fuel combustion, and the biogas upgrading. In this section, we will mainly focus on the post-combustion CO2 capture, where the CO2 and the N2 are the major composition, where CO2 about 20% and nitrogen about 80 volume percent. It is typically conducted at near ambient conditions. So in terms of the CO2 capture, the common way that's been conducted in the industry is the amine scrubbing, where it is used the amines to actually conduct a nuclear fluid attack between the amine and CO2 to form the CN bond. So depending on the properties of the amine functionalities, either primary, secondary, tertiary, different products uh, can be generated. However, the major problem in the greenhouse gas capture using the amine scrubbing is due to several drawbacks, such as it has a high enthalpy adsorption. Typically, it means that you need a lot of energy to actually conduct the regeneration process. And also the instability of amine towards heating, that means that you cannot heat at a very high temperature because it tends to decompose, and also potential corrosion towards the vessel, and lastly, the heat capacity, because usually for the amine scrubbing, the solution is to be prepared with water. So due to a very high heat capacity of water, actually the overall process is not that energy efficient. So the approach that people have been trying is using the porous material. 
because the porous material actually possess an active site uh, that allows a favorable interaction towards the CO2 because there's a higher polarizability and also the quadrupole movement. Due to this uh, effect, actually the adsorbents or the nanoporous material will tend to absorb CO2 as compared to N2 as the major composition of the post-combustion CO2 capture is mainly CO2 and N2. However, we, in this section, we we're going to take note on the potential of the third component, which is a water vapor, because typically water vapor is also present uh, in the flue gas. So you're going to see how these uh, water molecules actually will affect the adsorption capability of the porous material. So generally, the major challenge on the nanoporous material in CO2 capture, particularly in the case of post-combustion CO2 capture, is the requirement to have very high CO2 binding energy at low partial pressure because at the ambient condition, actually the CO2 concentration is only about 0.2 bar. So typically, we need to ensure that adsorbent has a uh, capability to absorb CO2 at low partial pressure. And the second effect is actually the humid condition. So we look at the first one, which is the CO2 partial pressure. Typically, most of the case, people report the properties of adsorbent using the CO2 adsorption isotherm. This is typically a well-developed technology. So with this uh, technology, we actually able to determine the amount of CO2 absorbed based on different uh, porous material. In most of the case, people tend to report at the one bar, which is actually incorrect because the most relevant uh, CO2 adsorption is actually at 0 0.2 bar and below because this is the amount that will pretty be absorbed at the post-combustion CO2 capture condition. And also the another thing is uh, the presence of the water molecules. So to investigate the competition between several gases, typically current uh, experimental approach is still very challenging. And the most common way is actually using the breakthrough measurement. Typically just an illustration here. Typically you have an adsorbent, you place it in the adsorption cell. So what you do is you actually feed the gas, which contains CO2, nitrogen, and also water molecules into the adsorbents. And then after a while, because the CO2 will tend to be absorbed fully. So after it is being absorbed fully, so the CO2 will come out at a later period of time. So then you can treat this as a retention time. That means the N2, which has a weaker binding energy towards the adsorbent, will propagate at a shorter period of time, whereas the CO2, which has a higher binding energy towards the adsorbent, will propagate out at a longer period of time. And from here, we can determine the amount of CO2 absorbed, which is through this measurement. However, the investigation of the adsorption desorption cycling with the presence of water is actually rarely conducted. So in this work, we have been trying uh, to investigate such behavior under repetitive adsorption desorption cycling through three different uh, categories of adsorbent. So the first category is a zeolite-based material, which is ETS-10, zeolite 5A, and 13S, which has shown they have very good CO2 adsorption at low partial pressure. The second category will be the metal organic framework, uh, the two common one, and also lastly is the amine impregnator, Adsorbent. That means we use, we develop the porous adsorbents and then we do the post synthetic functionalization with the amines. So we try to conduct this uh, breakthrough measurement through this schematic illustration. Firstly, we will try to degas our adsorbent with the use of argon gas with heating, which is to simulate the pressure vacuum, uh, simulate the heating at a high vacuum to actually activate our adsorbent. After that, we investigate the test gas which is the CO2N2 in dry condition, which is the first part of this line. And then after that, we also investigate the rapidity cycling under the humid condition. So let's look at the result. So the first category, we can see that for most of the zeolite material, we actually tend to show very high CO2 adsorption at low partial pressure, which has shown in this case, actually it shows a very rapid adsorption at low partial pressure and saturate at one bar. Such type of porous material is more advantageous for post-combustion CO2 capture because it's a very high CO2 uptake at low partial pressure. And also fractional uptake, which is actually a property of uh, kinetics, as an adsorption kinetics, which means how long you actually to get this adsorption point, which this each adsorption point is an equilibrium point. So we actually investigate that most of the porous material we develop for this category actually shows a fractional uptake of close to one at a very short period of time. 
And also the major advantage is this porous material has a very high uh, thermal stability. So in terms of activation condition, it's not as uh, challenging. However, if we try to investigate the performance in dry and humid condition, you can see a very clear difference. In case of dry condition, all the three porous material actually can show a reasonable stable a CO2 adsorption across the cycle. Whereas for the case of humid condition, you can see that the CO2 capture actually decreased gradually across the cycle. This is typically because of the binding energy, which is you can show from this uh, figure here. You can see it's a very high uh, power visibility and also the quarrel pole movement as compared to the other components. So that's why it's actually very difficult for the water molecules to actually rapidly desorb from the active site. That's why, as you can see that across the cycle, actually the CO2 adsorption actually decreases. So typically such a behavior uh, is typically commonly observed in zeolite materials. Whereas for the second category, which is the use of metal organic framework, because for the case of HKSD1 and the nickel DOBDC, actually has an active site that allows a favorable uh, interaction towards the CO2. So that's why at low partial pressure, actually the CO2 adsorption is actually quite high. For the case of HKSD1, it's a more of a linear relation as compared to the CO2 adsorption and also the pressure. And also from here, you can see the refractional uptake actually shows a rapid saturation as well. That means in terms of kinetics, we can expect it absorb at a very faster pace and it will reach equilibrium quickly. Whereas if you look at the repetitive adsorption desorption cycle, you can see quite a different behavior. For the case of nickel DOVDC, actually the CO2 adsorption actually decreases. Technically what you can observe is that because uh, the metal organic framework typically for these two adsorbents, they are less stable towards the water molecules. So that's why the amount of CO2 absorbed actually gradually decrease across the cycle. But for the case of HKC1, we still able to observe uh, a reasonably stable CO2 adsorption under the humid condition. Technically, this is just because uh, HKC1 actually, it was found that in the future studies, although it's still debatable, uh, the HSC1 actually still can show reasonable amount of CO2 adsorbed under the reasonably small amount of humid condition. But the problem is both HSC1 and nickel DOBC, they are not as water stable. So if you actually saturate the HSC1 and nickel DOBC with water molecules and you conduct the CO2 adsorption, you'll see that uh, all the adsorbents will get killed. That means actually you have lost the crystallinity for both HKSC1 and nickel DOVDC for these two porous adsorbent. Whereas the third category, which is the amine impregnated adsorbent. So this is typically done by developing the adsorbents and then conduct the post-synthetic functionalization. So here you can see that we can actually achieve a high CO2 adsorption at low partial pressure. But the problem is because of the dangling, the presence of the dangling amine groups, which you can observe that the kinetics is actually very, very slow and it takes a very long time to actually reach equilibrium. So based on the data that we have obtained, we can see that although the absorption actually gradually decrease, it will reach eventually a stable value after each cycle. This decrease is just attributed to the difficulty of the CO2 to do the desorption because it's very slow kinetics. But eventually the CO2 absorb will actually stabilize because in the humid condition, particularly, the interaction between the amine and CO2 together with water molecules can form a carbonate species. And this is a reversible process. They said the amount of CO2 absorbed is actually fairly constant. But the main problem is because of after the amine impregnation, actually the diffusivity actually decreases a lot due to the dangling amine groups. That's why the, actually the CO2 absorption actually show such type of behavior across a cycle. So in general, we can see that uh, the CO2 adsorption under the dynamic condition actually will be much lower than equilibrium condition, generally because for the case of dynamic condition, we don't really wait until we reach equilibrium. So in this case, uh, the amount of CO2 adsorption is quite different. For the case of HKC1 and the prime uh, MCM41, amine impregnated, you're actually able to absorb the CO2 under the humid condition. However, as compared to the rest, actually both under humid condition, the amount of CO2 absorbed actually decreases. 
how the problem in these two porous material is this porous material actually shows a poor absorption, whereas for this porous material actually shows a very low partial the CO2 uptake at the low partial pressure of CO2. That means there's no rapid saturation at the desired pressure that we are interested in, which is 0.2 bar. And also we will try to also examine the properties of absorption desorption of the absorbents in the palletized form because when it's palletized form, the diffusion behavior can be very, very different as compared to the powdered absorbents. Please, uh, I would like to end my presentation here. Uh, I would like to thank my PhD supervisor, Prof. Bay, uh, who supervised my PhD from 2015 to 2019, and also Prof. Wang Rong, who is currently the director of the Singapore Membrane Technology Center. Uh, with this, I would like to end my presentation here, and thank you very much for listening to my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. So once again, we'll pause for Q&A. If you have a question, please type it into the questions box now. I'll give you a moment on that. The ICME 2020 Global Awards webinar series concludes this afternoon when our president, Stephen Richardson, will reveal the winner of the Outstanding Achievement in Chemical and Process Engineering Award. The webinar is free to attend and open to all. So if you'd like to register, there's still time. Find out more at icame.org forward slash global awards. OK, we don't appear to have any questions. So thank you very much for that. We're going to move on to our next finalist. Now, please welcome Lo Ling Yi from Zhejiang University. Either can you see my screen? Yes, we can see your screen and we can hear you clearly. All right, sure. And I'll start. So greetings, uh, organizers, panelists, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Lao Liang Yi from Malaysia. Today, I will just briefly introduce to you about myself and the research that I'm focusing on. This is my email address. I took my undergraduate studies from the University of Mobility, majoring in Western after that, I continue my PhD degree in NSU University of Asia on a project related to smart drug delivery system for anti-cancer therapy. Then I continue as a research fellow at NASH in one year for one year. And now I am a postdoctoral researcher at the Institute of Pharmaceuticals Zhejiang University of China. Here are some of my other foundations. This is my Google profile. Everything that I present to you in the file will be available in this profile. Let's move on to my research experience. During my PhD time, as I say, I developed a drug system. It's a pickering emulsion stabilized by magnetic cellulose nanocrystal that can be used for colon cancer therapy. A pickering emulsion, very good one. Is the emulsion stabilized by solid particles instead of conventional spectrum? And the solid particles that I use is, of course, the magnetic cellulose nanocrystal. It consists of magnetic nanoparticle Fe3O4 that is super paramagnetic and biocompatible, as well as cellulose nanocrystal PNC that is biodegradable and abundantly available. I combine them together by a core precipitation. From the magnetic cells and now transmitted it to absorb them onto the surface of oil droplet to produce the magnetic emulsion below the SNC and CP. Then we load the drug, model drug is curcumin into the for colon cancer therapy. The MC and CPD is controllable by magnetic field to target the tumor. And you just need to increase the magnetic force to reduce the current. This is the main project of my PhD. 
besides this one, I also work on another side project involving the characterization of an ultrasound turbulence that we can show you here. It's just a very simple characterization experiment involving the sonal chemiluminescence studies. This is the top view of the reactor. I use the sonal chemiluminescence study to map the ultrasound wave distribution of the reactor during its operation. And this blue color is, is basically indicating that the ultrasound wave is uniformly distributed across the entire reaction medium during its operation. And as a proof of concept study, we also prepare Pickering emulsion using just normal CNC and it has been successful. Now, this is just one of the applications. Since then, the Pickering emulsion that I produce is actually comparable to those prepared using our conventional ultrasound horn system, indicating that the ultrasound turbular reactor is a larger scale of system, ultrasound system that can be used for many applications that generally a researcher would use horn to do it. So that's all for the PhD part. After my graduation, as I say, I continue a research fellow in Monash University. I plan to continue to work on the drug delivery system. However, there isn't enough resources for me at that time. So while I'm looking for opportunity and grant, I begin to improve my knowledge on nanoparticle synthesis. Previously, I formed MCNC and used it to stabilize Pickering emulsion for drug delivery. During my research fellow time, I also prepared another two nanoparticles, namely the magnetic nanoparticles coated with PDMA EMA. It's a pH responsive polymer. So this will make it pH and magnetic responsive, and I use it to prepare emulsion for oil recovery. I also prepared the GMS and you just just a very simple food emulsion. Besides that, I've written two review papers during my research fellow time and successfully published them. And thanks to this, this uh, outcome that I've produced during the one year contract, I'm able to secure a position in Zhejiang University under Croft and Daishun Group. And now I can continue to work on the smart drug delivery system. The system that now I'm working with is the dynamic nano assemblies that can be used for various biomedical applications, including, but not uh, <coughs> limited to tumor, neurodegenerative disease, strokes, and etc. And for me, of course, the first target will be on tumor. When we talk about tumor, why is the tumor so hard to treat, even though there are plenty of medicine available and developed to, for to their treatment, but all of them seems to have a very not satisfying result. The main reason is because when tumor is formed, the microenvironment around the tumor will be modulated to form something we call tumor microenvironment, TME. This tumor microenvironment is a very complex system that will form a multi layers of barriers stopping the medicine to reach tumor cell. That's why it is not working because the medicine didn't even reach the tumor. So to address this issue, we propose the use of dynamic nano assembly, which consists of nanoparticles, the tumor microenvironmental modulator, and drug where they will just assemble together to form a nanostructure that can undergo reversible conformational change upon meeting different TME stimuli. They can either change by assembling, disassembling, change its shape, size, etc. Depends on how you design it. In that case, the dynamic nano assembly can nicely locate the tumor. Then it will react with different TME stimuli to either penetrate or remodulate the entire microenvironment, which eventually kill the tumor. I've included all this information and examples of studies uh, published in this review paper that I've recently published in Journal Control Replace. You guys can take a quick read at it if you're interested. So besides tumor, my future, other future plan would be on neurodegenerative disease as well, such as, for example, like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's kind of disease. 
dynamic nano assemblies will be very useful for the neurodegeneration because in the neurodegenerative disease there is also something called micro that neurodegenerative microenvironment. But anyway, everything that I do on neurodegeneration is only up to a review. So I will not talk a lot on that. So this is our group web page. You guys can take a look, click a visit to our web page if you are interested to know more about what we can do via this link here. Or you can just search for Prof. Ling Tai Sun in Google. Easily you can get there. So that's all for my presentation. If you have any question regarding the project that you wish to work for, not only in my current and future work, but also in my previous PhD work, you can contact me and we will guide you to the person in charge. So for all those work that I've done, I'd like to thank the, these three research groups for their help to complete all those projects, as well as the funding agency and partners for their financial support. Also, I'd like to thank iCami for organizing the event and DPE for sponsoring the award so that I have a chance to be here as a finalist to share to you about my research. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So once again, we'll pause for Q&A. If you have a question, please type it in now. Right then, we don't appear to have any questions, so we'll move on. Thank you very much. And our next Thank speaker, you. please welcome Prabharaj Balakrishnan from Jiangsu University. Hello. Hi, we can hear you and we can see your screen. Oh, excellent. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, it's a great pleasure to interact with you all in this uh, iChemy Global Awards event. Uh, I am Dr. Prabharaj, a principal investigator working on fuel cells and flow batteries lab here in Jiangsu University, China. Uh, so in this uh, presentation, I would like to share with you all about my research work which is using a new class of materials to decrystallize in improving the power performance of fuel cells and flow batteries. So first I will give a quick background on uh, methanol fuel cells and its mechanism of operation and then I will move on to the importance of uh, the first member of uh, 2D materials family graphene and its importance and then I will give my, my uh, key uh, results uh, obtained using graphene in the methanol fuel cell systems and then I will move on to uh, overall summary and acknowledgements. Fuel cell. A fuel cell is a device that converts the chemical energy of the fuel directly into electrical energy by a simple oxidation reduction reaction mechanism. The fuel can be of methanol or ethanol or acetone or propanol. And what you get is, uh, is electrical energy and some side products. And this fuel cell has significant advantages like simplicity and handling and maintenance, silence during operation, and less release of harmful environmental contaminants during its operation. So I specialize in uh, using um, methanol because methanol itself being a liquid fuel has an advantage. At the same time, it has high energy density than hydrogen. So all these features make uh, the methanol fuel cell an attractive candidate among different fuel cell types and also an attractive uh, energy conversion device when you compare them to batteries or supercapacitors. If you take a closer look onto the engine room of methanol fuel cells, this comprises of two main components. One is the electrodes on the two sides with the membrane in the center. So this assembly is called as the membrane electrode assembly. So we supply methanol on the one side and the air on the other side. This methanol undergoes oxidation to produce electrons and the protons. 
these electrons travel through the external circuit from one side to the other side, whereas protons travel through the membrane from the anode to the cathode. These electrons and the protons are utilized on the cathode side to produce water. So as a result of electron transfer, we have the electrical energy. So researchers work on two different components. One is the electrode component, another is the membrane component. In the electrode component, they work to improve the electron transfer process so as to get a higher power output. At the same time, on the membrane side, they work on different membrane materials so as to improve their proton transfer with, uh, with main aim to be the increasing the, the electrical power output. So although fuel cells, that is the methanol fuel cells, have significant features, so they are hindered by two main factors on their road to commercialization. There are two main factors, the first and second. The first factor is taking place in the membrane. If you take a closer look on the what's happening on the membrane side, on the membrane side, it is known that the proton transfer takes place. At the same time, we have an issue which is a methanol crossover phenomenon. It is a process in which the methanol tends to diffuse from one side to the other side due to this uh, usage of this, uh, again, the liquid fuel. So this creates a side reaction. In ideal cases, the methanol should react only on the anode side and the air should react only on the cathode side. But in practical cases, methanol, uh, due to this crossover phenomena, creates a side undesired side reaction. As a result, drastically reduces the power output of the system. And this is the one of the major hindrances. And the next, coming to the second, the one taking place in the electrode region. As we know that electrode transfer takes place through the electrode. So there is a need for high conducting, electron conducting material so as to improve the higher output. So overall, there are two main factors for commercialization, one is the membrane side and another is the electrode side. On coming on to the, the material scenario, our human kind has been fascinated by the advent of different materials. And, and one thing material our researchers are excited about uh, in this decade, especially in this decade, is, is the graphene, the new, the first 2D material ever discovered. So what makes a graphene an interesting candidate among different carbon materials available in the market is because of its exceptional physiochemical properties. The few of them could be uh, uh, the high electric, uh, electronic conductivity, and the next is the high mechanical strength, and steel and that its dense packing structure making it uh, available to allow uh, specifically allow uh, exact transport of some some of them on uh, blocks uh, some other uh, materials so these factors make the make the material graphene an interesting candidate uh, Coming on to my research work uh, on using these 2D materials in the electrode and the membrane component of uh, the methanol fuel cells, uh, I'm, I'm, sh I'm sharing uh, very few results uh, of, of my research work uh, done in my, uh, during my PhD in the University of Manchester and here in my uh, postdoc work here in Jiangsu University. Uh, on, on to the membrane side, we have uh, studied uh, the usage of the one atom thick graphene uh, from uh, from the results from the Nobel Prize winning team, uh, Professor Andrew Geim and Kostinov, and they have shown that this gra single atom thick graphene has the tendency to allow the protons at the same time can has the ability to block uh, the other alcohol based components. So we have used this graphene in a working fuel cell system. And we found some interesting results, which was this graphene uh, allowed the transport of uh, protons with no resistance, at the same time blocked uh, the passage of methanol. As a result of this, we found some interesting improvement in performance to around 45% uh, improvement. Uh, this result is a, a key step, uh, is considered as a key step in the, the fuel cell research, because whereas previous materials have shown a balanced of both 
proton conductivity and methanol crossover, whereas here we have shown uh, negligible resistance to protons at the same time blocking uh, the methanol crossover. Well, as a result, we, are, we, we were able to publish this uh, in uh, Advanced Energy Materials Journal. And uh, this is the, the key uh, improvements in the membrane area. And coming on to the electrode area, and we, from our, one of our collaborators, uh, we, uh, we used uh, activated carbon, which has uh, got uh, interesting electronic properties at the same time, good porous pore structure, so as to allow the transport of reactants uh, from the external to the catalyst site, at the same time aided in the, the removal of uh, the product molecules uh, from the reactant site to the external. So we are using this uh, activated carbon uh, in, onto the electrode uh, material. So as a result, uh, we found some uh, interesting phenomena, especially in the high current density operations, which is which where the rate of the reaction is so high, where it requires uh, uh, the carbon material to remove the to remove the, the product molecules at a higher faster rate. This activated carbon played a main role in this region. As a result, we were able to obtain some around 30% improvement in performance uh, in conjunction with the conventionally used material. Uh, the blue one indicates the standard. Standard is like uh, the control sample, whereas the activated uh, carbon uh, electrode shows uh, it is used in conjunction uh, together with uh, other standard materials. Uh, and these results were published in uh, Electrochemica Acta. So we have used uh, uh, this, uh, this new class of 2D materials uh, in the electrode and the membrane component. And we were able to uh, show some, uh, achieve some improvement in, in the methanol fuel cell. Uh, I have uh, categorized my research work into three different areas. The one is the research, teaching, and the science communication. In terms of research, on, uh, we have managed to obtain very good uh, publications and uh, research grants uh, from funding agencies, and we were able to uh, present our research works in different international conferences in uh, UK, USA, Canada, Holland, Spain, and Brazil. Uh, in terms of uh, teaching work, uh, I'm now an associate fellow of, uh, from Higher Education Academy, and now uh, as I have developed my uh, both national and international teaching experience, I have, I'm now on my way for uh, a fellowship uh, from this uh, Higher Education Academy. And when it comes to outreaching, uh, due to this uh, importance of uh, and the significance of the results obtained uh, in my PhD and my postdoc, and we were able to uh, uh, give uh, my TEDx talk, which is available in YouTube, and present our works in the Museum of Science and Industry, in Manchester, and then Royal Science Society Summer Science Exhibition uh, in London as well. And you can find uh, the list of uh, all my research works uh, uh, in my webpage, which is www.probraj.co.uk. Uh, in addition, you can find uh, the links uh, for my TEDx talks, a list of uh, rest of uh, all my publications, grant contributions uh, in my in my web page as well. And I would like to request you all to communicate with me uh, through my web page, where you can find the my uh, social media links such as Twitter, LinkedIn, uh, all in my uh, research uh, web page. And all these research works wouldn't be possible without uh, the due contribution from my uh, previous and present mentors and especially the collaborators uh, such as from Rice University, USA and Ankara University, Turkey and National Graphic Institute, University of Manchester, UK. And many thanks to my uh, uh, funding agencies for their general support, uh, especially from uh, Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council, UK and the China Postdoctoral Science Foundation. Uh, thank you all uh, for listening to my presentation. Uh, I'm now looking forward for the questions. Okay, thank you very much. So once again, we'll pause there and take a break for questions. So if you have a question, please type it into the questions box on GoToWebinar.
We have our first question. What is the membrane area for the single layer graphene developed in slide eight? Uh, yes, I can. Yes, uh, we used a uh, single layer graphene, which is uh, synthesized by chemical vapor deposition technique. Uh, first, uh, we deposit a sing single layer graphene onto the copper foil during the, the chemical vapor deposition process. And then we transferred this single layer graphene onto our fuel cell electrode. And then we tested this uh, for performance improvement in actual fuel cell testing system. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, that appears to be the only question we have. So thank you very much. We're going to move on to our final finalist of the day. Yeah, Please welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Please welcome GSK's Samir Dayab. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can, yes. And my webcam, oh, hold on. It's covered up there, hold on, there we go. Okay. Just trying to find the window mode so I can see my presentation at the same time. Okay. Can you all see my presentation? Yes, we can. Yes. Excellent. Okay. Hi, everybody. My name is uh, Dr. Samir Diab. It's a real pleasure to be presenting here at the Institution for Chemical Engineers Global Awards. I was nominated for the Young Researcher category today by the University of Edinburgh, where I did my Master's in Engineering, Chemical Engineering, which I received in 2016. And then following that, I received my PhD there this year at the Institute for Materials and Processes in the School of Engineering with Dr. Dimitros Garagiorgis. I'm now Senior Scientist in System Modeling and Simulation at GSK and Process Analytics in the UK. And today all I'd like to do is give you sort of a brief summary of my research that I conducted during my PhD work at the University of Edinburgh, which I've broadly titled in this presentation as Computational Modeling of Separation Processes for Continuous Pharma Manufacturing. Um, there we go. So a little bit of background on pharma R&D. So of all, manufa of all manufacturing sectors, pharma has the highest R&D intensity. Um, the span is well above the average of the manufacturing sectors. And in addition to this, um, pharma manufacturing is also very materially intensive. And this is because you know, you're generally synthesizing pretty complex in terms of molecular structure, active pharmaceutical ingredients, intermediates and therefore they require multi-step syntheses, perhaps intermediate purifications that require a lot of solvent in order to meet the strict purity requirements that are required for um, drug substances because they're made for human consumption. They're very regulated. On top of this, there's also quite long product and process development times, which leads to um, rather small windows in which a process and a product's patent uh, remains um, valid before competition from generics manufacturers comes along. And so remaining cost effective in um, any manufacturing sector, but especially given the pressures that are on the farm industry, remaining cost effective is important. One can aid process and product development by modeling and optimization for in silico design in order to help R in order to support R&D efforts and as well to rapidly screen uh, processes for optimality, whether that be in terms of material efficiency, costs, what have you. Modeling and optimization can be used to reduce experimental efforts to this end. To this end. Now, traditionally, when we think of pharma manufacturing, it's mostly batch manufacturing for various reasons, but um, in the past couple of decades, there's been a lot of, a lot of um, effort and attention received for continuous pharma manufacturing efforts for its potential for process and cost benefits versus existing batch methods. However, there's been, while well, there's been many demonstrations of continuous flow syntheses of different APIs and their intermediates, there's disproportionately low number of continuous separations designs implemented along with these flow syntheses. So this presents a bottleneck for um, a successful implementation of continu continuous manufacturing for pharma. And so in order to 
maximize the success of continuous manufacturing where it's seeming like a viable option, uh, one needs to screen for optimal designs. And that's where my research comes in. So where my research has worked at is using modeling and optimization for the technical economic evaluation of CPM plant designs, considering different case studies of APIs, which have previous experimental CPM demonstration. The process is considered uh, is focusing on the upstream production in pharma, so production of the drug substance. So that's considering of the reaction, purification, and separation processes. And using these process models and these different case studies, we want to formulate optimization problems, simulation studies, um, in order to find the most optimal, viable um, CPM plant designs for these different APIs. So what does far upstream pharmaceutical process modeling involve? So let's look at typical process first. First things first, you need to synthesize your API. So you start with, uh, in a continuous process, you start with the synthesis and flow. So you have some starting materials, which I've denoted SM here. You then synthesize your um, API in one or more um, reactors, and then you produce your API, or uh, which, and the number of steps here depends on typically on the complexity of your starting materials as well as the molecular the structural complexity of the API molecule that you're trying to make. Depending on the composition of your outlet of your reactor and how uh, I, how, um, how many components are there remaining, what, your, what conversion and yields you attain during your synthesis, you may have to perform a purification. Now, this is often done by liquid liquid extraction, which is also amenable to continuous operation. So what you do here is you form a biphasic mixture and you then either separate your API, your desired uh, molecule into another phase and, and try aim to retain your impurities um, in the existing phase or vice versa. You want to retain your API in one phase and separate your impurities into another. And this is done by addition of a solvent, which is emissible with the incoming solvent from the reaction process. Following the liquid liquid extraction, so you've got a pure phase, um, which you, you may or may not have implemented this LLE stage, depending on the how well your reaction was prone to its composition. What's another you know, operation that's very important in pharmaceutical manufacturing is crystallization, given the number of drug substances and drug products that are administered in solid form, like tablets or dispersions, topical ointments, what have you. So crystallization is an important process here. And from there, you get your drug substance, which is then formulated into a drug product of some kind, which is done considered in downstream manufacturing. So of these uh, unit operations, what are the process models we need to consider? What are the modeling considerations? So the flow synthesis, we need to understand our reaction kinetics. And this is done by, so we need to understand the rate law, the um, rate constants, your Arrhenius parameters, what have you, and you typically you regress these from available experimental data. And these are then used to inform the size of the reactor you required, which is dictated on the by the conversion you want, the target plant capacity of API as well. In modeling liquid liquid extraction, you need to consider the need to be able to predict the phase equilibrium. So we need to consider solid liquid equilibria, i.e. the solubility of your API in your different phases as a function of different process conditions. So the amount of LLE solvent you're adding, your operating temperature, and we need to consider the non-ideal behavior of this. And this is often done through um, activity coefficient models such as UNIFAC or, NRT or NRTL. And in addition to be able to predicting the, um, the solid liquid equilibria, we need to be able to predict these liquid liquid phase compositions, which will dictate um, the solubility of the API in the different phases and thus the rate of mass transfer between and therefore your recovery and also your material efficiency of the liquid extraction process. In the crystallization process, we need to consider uh, solubility behavior as a function of the way you're generating the supersaturation. So you might be doing this by cooling crystallization, anti-solvent addition, pH driven crystallization, what have you. You also need to understand your crystallization kinetics. So the um, rate of nucleation, your rate of crystal growth, and perhaps other terms such as um, agglomeration and breakage that may, be that may be occurring depending on the crystallizer design you're considering. We need a mass balancer in the crystallizer in order to calculate your process yields and the stream flow rates. And you also need a population balance in order to um, describe how your particle size distribution as well as the mean crystal size, which is another important attribute of um, product quality here. 
And so that's the process model. Now, what ties all this together? So I'd mentioned we were wanting to look at the costing of the process, and that's what ties this together. So for a given process or upstream plant design, you need to be able to calculate, you estimate the cost of your process configuration. So you need a capital expenditure component, your operating expenditures, and then you want to predict, you want to uh, estimate the economic viability either as your plant total cost or net present value. So we want to, as I said in the first slide, what we want to be doing is identifying um, APIs which have experimental precedents from which we can build these process models. But we also want them to be able to cover, also want to consider a range of different cases that cover lots of different therapeutic applications, as well as process complexity, as well as modeling approach as well. And during my research, I've considered quite a lot, as you can see, of different APIs of different therapeutic applications different flow sheet types. So these the cases I've considered cover flow synthesis followed by separation, that being the main ones I've considered here are liquid, liquid extraction and crystallization in MSMPR cascades. And in some of the cases, what I've done is just consider the crystallization cascade. So just the, just the crystallization without consideration of synthesis. And the different approaches I've used have been um, either a process simulation, um, multiple simulations in order to identify promising process designs, nonlinear optimization or nonlinear programming, NLP, for optimization of a given process design, and mixed integer nonlinear programming or MINLP for optimal process synthesis. And as I said, these are all based on experimental precedents, which are shown in the right column here for these different APIs. So the aim of this model, these modeling approaches, we want to be able to rapidly screen continuous plant designs for different APIs. And the methodology, modeling methodology and approach we use depends on the level of, level of complexity we want to consider regarding the process itself, the model we want to construct and its, its solution, and the level of insight we want to gain as well. So one can simply perform the flow sheet simulation where this is useful for a relatively quick analysis of a process and you want to and it can be done just quickly with a, for a design case with few decision with few design or decision variables, should we say, in the um, in the model. So an example I'm showing here is we look at the case of the flow synthesis and anti-solvent crystallization of rafinamide, where here I'm showing these, these blue bars and is um, the plant yield that you gain as a function of multiple simulation points for the anti-solvent to feed ratio as well as the final reactor temperature in the flow synthesis as well. And from this one can compare the economic viability of different process designs and make a decision based on there. One can take this further and perform a non-linear optimization in order to find the exact process values that give you some, meet some objective that you set. So this might be, for example, a maximum yield, a maximum NPV for economic optimality, or perhaps a minimum total cost. So here what I'm showing is, um, in this sort of this bubble diagram here is the total cost minima for different plant designs for uh, MSMPR cascade for the cooling crystallization of cyclosporine, considering different cases of number of crystallizers in your cascade as well as different plant capacities as well. And this is showing the different optimum residence time in the crystallizers required in order to reach those, reach those total cost minima as well as the corresponding crystallization operating temperatures. And one can also, if you wanted to visualize your um, um, space in terms of the decision variables, you can generate a response service, as I've shown here, or your total cost on the z-axis, and you have your decision variables in the x and y. And one can then also perhaps, um, as well as considering the total cost of your plant, also look at how that's impacting the cost of goods of your API depending on your plant, cap plant capacity and the total cost of the design you've, um, the design configuration that your model has generated. One can then take that to step even further and use um, your model for optimal process synthesis. So this uses mixed integer and nonlinear programming where we start from some flow sheet superstructure, which describes um, X number of units and then the, flow sh the stream allocations, for example, um, of a recycle process, as I've shown here for an MSMPR cascade, 
Um, so a, a mixed integer problem has both continuous and binary decision variables or integer, integer decision variables. So your continuous variables might be your vessel volumes and operating temperatures, um, recycle flow rates, and the integer uh, variables might, the binary variables might be um, stream allocation or a recycle stream allocation here. And what one then does is solve this mixed integer problem to then describe, um, to then find your optimal flow sheet configuration and unit operation design variables in order to meet some objectives. So here for the continuous crystallization and MSMPR cascades of Melitrosin, in this case here in the right, it's I formulated this problem for maximization of NPV of a process. And one can then also perform a sensitivity analysis on different economic or design parameters of your units. So what are the main contributions I've made from my research? One, I've performed um, plant-wide design by simulation optimization and MILP for multiple APIs, including reaction and separation for upstream synthesis of drug substances, many different ones with different therapeutic applications. We used economic optimization by NLP for different flow synthesis um, with separation as well as purely separation cascades. And this aspect involved the first demonstration of economic nonlinear optimization for MSMPR cascades in the literature. And also process synthesis for, for economic optimality by MINLP. And my research presented the first MINLP demonstrations for economic process synthesis for farm upstream plants, namely flow synthesis with LLE cascades, liquid liquid extraction cascades, and um, MINLP for process for eco for optimal process synthesis of MSMPR cascades for the cooling crystallization of melitrosin with recycle. And finally, I would be remiss if I didn't uh, conclude my presentation by thanking the many institutions and bodies that have, um, and people that have hosted and funded me throughout my PhD research, as well as the many colleagues at GSK where I'm now working, who I've learned, I'm still continuing to learn a lot from. Thank you everybody for your attention. And yes, I'll take some questions now. Okay, thank you very much. So for the final time today, if you have any questions, please type them into the questions box. Okay, we have our first question. Do you encounter the situation where the results obtained or provided from the experimental precedents deviates at a substantial extent from computational modeling studies you have developed? So the, what we often do is so in the formulation of any of these problems, like in the formulation of any process model is you first need to validate it. So what we've often done is, um, so for example, in cases where we're designing liquid liquid extraction processes and uh, one process, one LLE solvent was considered in the literature, and then we considered some additional ones. What we'd first do is validate your model results versus one that was published. And then based on that, you can then, you have some confidence in your process model, and then you can expand to other things. So to answer your question, yes, you want to validate your process model first before considering, but nothing, no significant deviations from uh, literature work was really observed in my research. Okay, that's the only question we have. So thank you very much. And that wraps up all of our finalist presentations. And I'd like to thank all of our finalists for presenting today. I'm sure you'll agree we've had eight very interesting, very different presentations. But it's now time to announce the award winner. And we start with our highly commended entrants. And they are Chow Yong Yang and Vasilis Charitopoulos. So congratulations and well done to both of you. But now I'd like to hand back to BPE's Andrew Stevenson to announce the winner. So hi, yes, ladies and gentlemen, um, I'm pleased to announce the winner of the ICME 2020 uh, Young Research Award sponsored by BPE is Chu Kit Wayne. So congratulations. Yes, well done. Uh, Chu Kit Wayne, the winner of the ICME Young Researcher of the Year. If we can get you back on the line, how does it feel to be an ICME Award winner? I would like to thank the judges so much for this recognition and also to all my collaborators and uh, friends. Yeah, thank you so much. 
Well, well done and congratulations. So that wraps up today's webinar. Thank you everybody who has joined us, particularly our finalists and of course our sponsor BPE. But that's all for now. So it's goodbye and congratulations to Chu Kit Wayne, winner of the ICME 2020 Young Researcher Award. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you.